Dr. Dolan, are you familiar with the use of ketamine in pediatric patients? I'm very familiar with ketamine. Ketamine is a drug that we, uh, we use frequently. frequently. Um, it's part of our education um, in general. Uh, again, uh, it's something that we are very familiar with. It. In your experience, is ketamine used for the treatment of pediatric CRPS? It's not uh, the first line of treatment. Um, in, in general, you try to use uh, a, a other therapeutic me measures that don't involve medication. The standard of care of CRPS in the pediatric population. Okay, so uh, Dave, let's let's go back and, and, and play a little bit more on, on the subject of what we were talking about before, and you had made the comment that it, it, the heart-wrenching aspect of this case, the emotional aspect of this case, uh, may overcome the legal deficiencies on the difficulties in proving causation, foreseeability, things of that nature. Um, when I used to do civil back in the day, and this is a while ago, I felt that the pendulum was swinging with jurors, and um, especially in your state, but my state as well, with regard to quote-unquote tort reform. And all of the things I, call, I used to call tort deform, all the things that they did that put roadblocks in winning cases, allowing things to be reversed on appeal, putting caps on verdicts, and moreover, the ins insurance industry, at least by some estimations, I'm not saying it's right, but that put out there, lawsuits bad, lawsuits increase costs, lawsuits make things more expensive for you. Is that something that you, we were seeing that a lot as trial lawyers, where jurors were like, I, I think that the lawsuits are ridiculous. They should be limited. Just deal with it. Oh, yeah. Uh, big PR campaigns over the years from the business community to let people know that the hot coffee at McDonald's leads to a multi million dollar recovery, even though there's a lot more to it than that. But people have decided that the costs of insurance go way up because of frivolous lawsuits, when if you look deeper, you see that insurance companies are doing very well these days. They're making a hefty profit, but it's a re Republican talking point, and Florida's become a very red state. And so here we are where we don't fund DCF, Department of Children and Families, properly. We have extensive tort reform to limit the number of lawsuits. And yeah, and so you end up here where you have a case that may actually succeed despite all of those things. I did think one thing that, Bob, uh, the doctor's testimony was interesting about ketamine. She made a point right away to say it is unusual to prescribe ketamine. See, that's a defense. Like, look, the mother came in, they were doing these weird things, so of course the hospital is going to think there was some child abuse or, or uh, Munchausen's by proxy. So don't look at the hospital for being way outside the guidelines. All they have to do is being somewhere within the margins, within the 40-yard lines, and they get uh, the verdict here. Uh, but in the end, as I've said from the beginning, I think jurors are going to lead with their hearts rather than their heads. I, I, do we have any response to that, Ron, in terms of either the testimony that you just listened to and or uh, the importance of, I mean, maybe you want to comment on this a little bit. Sometimes a jury in one county would be one way and you could cross a county line, literally step over it, and another jury would come out with a completely different result depending on where you are. When you gave the initial question to my colleague, the first thing I came, the first thing I thought of was they must have spent so much time on jury selection to make sure people, they have people there that just, you know, won't just like throw their hands up like, oh, you know, it's a lawsuit, it's a money grab. That's the first people you need to get rid of and find out who they are. And with regards to the question that you've asked me, you know, absolutely one county would do better than another. Sometimes as a plaintiff, uh, you could, you wish you could choose, especially here in California. Uh, but, um, but yeah, absolutely. And, and then the other thing with the question, when she, when they, when they asked the question about ketamine, I looked at her, I'm like, what is she going to do? And she looked straight to the jury and she said, well, it's not the first thing we do. And so the, I, I believe that was a really not, not a very good answer because every, all the jury wants to know is like, what do the doctors think about this? Mm. And she kind of hedged and they're like, wait a minute. So it's not something that's crazy. It's something you just don't do first. So I think I, I, I personally, as a juror, I would have been, I would have been like, this was not a definitive unequivocal. You never do that. And I think that might be bad for the hospital. That's, but that's me. Yeah, no. Dave, I mean, I, I, I think, that, you know, it could have gone downhill for the, the hospital in this, but I think there was a great recovery, you tell me, uh, talking about she found it to be legal toxic doses that were being provided to her. She indicated that 
Um, she then went and investigated by call calling colleagues, pain management doctors, and uh, pediatric anesthesiologists. She reviewed literature. Um, and she had extremely uh, extreme concerns about the treatment that she was receiving. Does this, like you talked before, how she looked to, towards a jury? Uh, she also looked really strong towards a jury when she said this. So how do you think this boded for the hospital in the end analysis? Yeah, it was a great recovery. Remember, before we went to break, we were saying, ah, she didn't seem too convincing when she was saying that the ketamine administered wasn't really uh, supposed to happen. Like when she said that's out of the standard care, we we're like, yeah, she's sort of head. Well, here this time she's like, no, I've never seen this before in my nearly 20 odd years of medicine. And she was very definitive, very absolute with her statements. So yeah, at first coming on a little, maybe a little shell shock, a little nervous, she has settled in and has become a really strong witness for the defense. Yeah, and, and Ron, I, I mean, I'll just play devil's advocate for right now, playing the, if I were the hospital's attorney. They're doing their due diligence. It's not like they made a whimsical decision here. And if they were to believe that there was abuse going on, people can be passionate about that, report it and be passionate about it. Um, because don't you think jurors could also feel bad for the doctors and nurses who were following protocol doing what they thought was the right thing, even though they may at the end have been wrong, and when the 87 or 80 so odd day separation had nothing to do with them. It had to do with an investigative agency. Thoughts? Yeah, I, I think at, at hearing, and I, and I agree with my colleague, hearing uh, this doctor, you know, she's very sure, and she, she sounds very credible and genuine, and she's like, I was genuinely concerned, and I, I, was, I even doubted myself about my own concern. I think that's going to be very, very powerful for the jury. And I totally agree with the idea that maybe the jury will feel, will, will not, and maybe not empathize, but just believe the doctor, at least this doctor, maybe the other doctors, that they were doing what they were trained to do. And it seemed like they were doing what they thought was best for, um, for Maya. And then someone else took that information and then maybe they caused the harm, but it wasn't this doctor or the other doctors or the system that is the hospital. So it was another system. Yeah, like we said before, pointing to the empty chair that already uh, settled in the case. 